We are so excited to be with you today. This is the largest uh, New England Chapter Connects that we have had. As of this morning, we had 358 folks registered. Um, so we are delighted to be with you all on this very important topic. I'm Donna Shea. Uh, I'm the director here at the T2 Center at UConn and also the co-chair of the New England uh, Chapter, ABWA Chapters Education Committee. Um, and we work very closely with our Public Works Awareness Committee to put these sessions on for you. Um, there are so many um, grant opportunities available to our local agencies. So we would think that this is a very timely topic. Before we get started, I wanna say that as always, we are very grateful to our chapter sponsors. Um, they allow us to do a lot of great educational programming and events. Um, and so we're very thankful to always have their support. We have several topics coming up. Um, October 26th, we have our winter operations topic, which will be a very timely um, and I'm sure a very well attended session. And on November 16th, um, we all know that there's a lot of workforce development challenges now. So we're gonna look at workforce planning in turbulent times and hear from some success stories. Um, Regina will be putting the registration links in the chat for you. So feel free to register uh, right after our session today. So without further ado, um, so for over 20 years, um, this lovely presenter has been a friend and colleague of mine and our centers, um, and she is very knowledgeable about this topic. Um, she's presented this several sessions around the country and uh, has generously offered her time today to us. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to my friend, Victoria Beal, who's the director of the Ohio LTAP Center, which is a sister center of ours uh, in Ohio. And she's also the assistant administrator for the ODOT's uh, Office of Local Programs. Victoria, thank you so much for doing this today. We're very excited to hear from you. And also for the folks, I'll let you know that you don't have to take notes uh, because we'll be sharing the presentation at the end of the session for you in the, in the chat. So Victoria, turning it over to you, thanks a lot. Thanks, Donna, and thank you everyone for joining us today. <clears throat> I'm gonna apologize in advance about my voice. Um, I did come down with COVID the last couple of days. Um, so I'm gonna do my very best, but I've got cough drops here next to me in case things go awry so we can keep things moving in the right direction. And I'm very glad to have everyone on this educational um, event. I, I am also a, a member of the APWA chapter here in Ohio and will be the Central Ohio chapter president next year. So I'm working into that role currently. And we feel very strongly in Ohio, as I know APWA does across the country, that these educational sessions and the ability to share with each other is key to continuing to grow the abilities of our public works teams. So what we're gonna discuss today is grant writing and how you can get started with grant writing. I'm not gonna give you the answers to where to find money and where every grant is that you should ever want to apply for. But what I'm gonna do is give you a framework um, and basically a, a, a method to get started if you haven't written for a grant before. And if you have, hopefully I'll give you some tips and tricks that you'll be able to um, employ as you work through future grant applications. What I'd like to do to make this as interactive as possible is have you join the conversation during our presentation through menti.com. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can either use your smartphone to scan the QR code using your camera, and that'll load up the menti.com site and get you started. Or you can go to menti.com and enter the code that's on the screen the 59783326. Now, if you're watching this as a recording, you're not gonna be able to participate in the Mentimeter polling. And um, I apologize for that, but you'll just have to next time, make sure you are able to join live if you wanna participate in that. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is get to know you as the audience um, a little better as we move through this webinar so I can make certain to customize um, my discussion with you about this topic. So thank you for the responses already. 
as folks are responding, you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a little person icon with a number above it. And that just shows us how many um, folks have actually responded to the polling question already. So it's like we're quickly approaching 60 responses and the majority of you are from local public agencies with some from state agencies and some from consultants and a few from other, which is fine. Um, we are happy to have everybody included. Like I said, I just wanted to get a better feel for who we have on the call today. I'm gonna move over to our next question. And I'd like to know what your experience level is with writing grants. And we are not tracking your answer in particular. So please feel free to be very candid with your responses today. I'm <clears throat> glad to see that there's a number of you who are just getting started. And I would encourage you to, you know, keep on this track. You know, everybody had, who's written for grants has to start somewhere. And the worst that can happen when you submit a grant application is that they say no. Um, and I'm pretty certain the majority of us have all heard that before in our lives. So, you know, it, it's okay. You have to start somewhere and we learn from our experiences. So I'm glad to see so many people who are getting started um, being um, participants in this learning experience. And I'm also glad to see that there's a number of individuals who have been writing grants for a while who have joined us as well. So I'm going to have some questions and comment opportunities later on. So for those of you who have written grants before, um, I'll be tapping into a bit of your knowledge and hopefully you'll be willing to share with us when we get to that point. So being that we're in uh, public works and we deal with the roads, I've laid out a little roadmap for us for our presentation today. And the way we're gonna go through this information, um, you don't have to be frantically taking screenshots or um, trying to write down quickly because I did create an outline for this material as well. And I know that Regina was gonna be sharing that with you in addition to the actual um, PowerPoint presentation from this morning. So uh, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna discuss how you can determine what needs you have for grants. And then we're gonna talk about information gathering and how important it is to get that ready ahead of time. We're gonna have a, a good discussion over looking for grants which address your needs. And then we're gonna talk about reviewing grant requirements in detail. Um, that's really important because, you know, missing a piece of a, a grant application can basically be the reason why you, you won't receive that grant. And I've had that happen in my career. So I want to make sure that you understand, you know, what your system can be to make certain that you don't miss any component that they've asked for. Then we're going to talk about planning out your grant completion strategy. Um, what to actually request on a grant, um, answering the questions that are asked on the grant application, and then last but certainly not least, we're going to discuss the importance of relationships. Um, and yes, relationships are key in the grant writing area. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move into our discussion. So on the screen, you see a number of little stickies there. Um, and you see a number of them that are yellow that say want, want, and then a blue one that, or bluish green that says need. And what you need to understand in this area is that grant, um, grant agencies, those who are giving the grants, the grantors, want to fund needs. They do not want to fund a want. And this kind of harkens back to our conversation when we were kids about our parents really explaining to us the difference between a need and a want. And, you know, as you're looking at grant applications, it's important to know what it is that your agency needs versus what it wants and how to focus in on um, explaining that need. So, you know, what is important is to describe the problem that's gonna be fixed with the grant funding. Um, <clears throat> a good example of this um, from my previous grant writing experience, and I've done grant writing now for over 20 years, um, 
not just within my LTAP center, but also um, as a volunteer within my community. Um, my local fire department, you know, had a need to purchase new turnout gear, which is the gear firefighters wear when they go in to a, a burning structure. And that gear, at least the time that I wrote for that application, um, couldn't be any older than 10 years. So we described the problem to be fixed with the grant funding we were requesting as being the replacement of turnout gear that had become outdated and was no longer um, able to be worn by firefighters and how we needed to have sufficient turnout gear in order for them to enter the, the structures that they were called to where fires um, were happening. And we explained why it was a need because we explained what the, the standards were for that equipment. Um, and then as a part of the need, you should definitely have a clear plan on what you're gonna spend the grant funds on. And, and in that example, we had a clear plan of spending the funds we were requesting on new turnout gear. So it's the same with your agency, whether it's a, a piece of equipment that you need to replace, or it's a, an improvement on your roadway that needs to happen. You need to make certain that you have clearly defined that and explained why the need is there and the importance of um, that funding to the need and have a clear plan for how the funds are gonna be spent. As a part of that, it's important for you to have a plan for delivering the project and whether the project is purchasing that turnout gear that I discussed, or it's actually a roadway enhancement that's gonna take a number of years, you know, have the steps and how you're gonna complete it laid out um, and explain to them how you're gonna measure success. You know, and no request is, is too small to put these steps together and to explain the measurement of the success. Um, another key piece is that grantors, the ones who give the grants, really want to understand how what they have funded is going to be maintained ongoing without their additional funds um, being committed. So say it's a, a project where you need to put in additional safety signs because of it being a, a high crash area or an area that you know, is same or similar to another high crash area where you know the crash is going to happen eventually, but it just hasn't happened there yet. You need to be able to explain how you're going to maintain those signs ongoing. So as a part of your application, not only do you want to have a clear plan for, you know, how that project's going to be completed, but how it's going to be funded in the future, because that lets grantors know that their funds aren't going to be in the long run wasted. You know, they don't wanna see something that is put in place and then goes to waste because it can't be maintained into the future. So would like to know from you now that you have, we've discussed this part about needs, if you could tell us in a word or two, um, some of your needs that you want to fund with grants. Let me back up to that. So once the responses come in, I believe the screen will start shifting around here. I can't know. There we go. Okay. Oh, there we go. Work zones, safety, connectivity, road improvements. Those are, are common things in our area. Absolutely. Sidewalks. Yes. Historic buildings. Multimodal transportation. Bridge improvements, yes. And I see this is a word cloud. So if someone responds with the same word that you sent in or a couple of words, then it'll actually show up larger on the screen. And as we see here, connectivity and safe roads or safety, bike lanes, those are some of the larger words that are coming up. So I appreciate everybody's responses there. And I once our presentation is complete today, we'll be sending a copy of the presentation with the responses out to Regina so she can forward it to everyone. So you've got the idea. I appreciate that. Good. So we'll keep moving. Um, step two, and this is 
an important part, and you can do this when we finish today. It'll be right around lunchtime. You can dig right into it. I know Donna, um, I've known her for a number of years. She's that type A personality that if she got off this webinar and needed to start putting together information for a grant, um, she would dig right into this portion. So it's important to get your general information about who your agency is ready ahead of time. You know, what does your agency do? Why are you important to your customers? And have it ready to go because you're going to have enough work to do as it is when a grant becomes available without having to back up and put all of this information together. So be Donna, channel her energy and get this information put together. Um, you know, part of what you're going to want to have ready is a, a table of organization for your agency, um, what your tax classification is. And, you know, this is important to know and have ready to go. When I went to apply for my first grant, I didn't have this information ready. And I did have to scramble to get quite a bit of it together. Excuse me. And um, one of the things I figured out um, was that our DOT, even though we are the state DOT and one of the largest agencies in the state, we are still part of the state of Ohio. So I had to put in the tax ID information for the state of Ohio. If there's little things like that that you're going to find as you put this information together that'll be a surprise to you or be something that you weren't aware of. And I definitely encourage you, get this information together ahead of time because you want to make certain that they know or that you have all that ready to go before you start having to work on the application. Another thing I want to make certain that you're aware of, is if you have applied before or even if you haven't, there's a number called a DUNS number, and they are no longer needed for grant applications at the federal level. What you want is a UEI, a unique entity identifier, and it takes a little bit of time to get a UEI. So if you have not applied for one before, um, make sure that you get that information um, ready to go, get the application in, get that UEI number. Um, we have some townships here in Ohio who were recently awarded grant applications, and they unfortunately are still trying to get their UEI numbers. And we can't do our agreement with them until they have that number in place. So um, don't be the, the township or, you know, the entity that is causing a delay. Um, you know, a lot of the applications, especially federal level applications, require you to have that number before you even submit the application. So just get it done and have it in place. Um, and I did talk about that already. The other thing you need to be aware of is sometimes people do refer to that UEI number as a SAM number, but it's the same thing. Um, so just make certain that you go through the process and get that number ready to go in your file. Another thing that's important to have in your file is information about projects that your agency has completed that are same or similar. Because what the grant funder, the grantor wants to see is that you have a good plan in place um, for what you wanna complete, but that you have also been successful in completing these types of projects in the past. Um, so if you have same or similar projects that have been completed in the past, and you can put that information in your file and have it ready to go, that is a, a step in the right direction. So make certain that you look at what it is that you wanna have funded and then look back into your agency's you know, recent history to see what information is available that you could have um, in the file ready to go when you find grant opportunities to apply for. So based on the information we just discussed, how many of you have that type of information already collected for future grants? Some, but not all, that's good. And a few of you, I guess more than a few now, are saying, yes, you have it ready to go. If you're starting from scratch, that is perfectly fine. If you don't have it, that's okay too. Like I said, just channel Donna's energy and get on it and get it pulled together. Um, it It's not a difficult thing to, get completed. It's just time consuming. So get it 
in place and that way it doesn't have to consume your time later when you're working on the actual application. So majority of you are in a great position and you know you have some um, or all of it. And for those of you who need to start pulling that information, you know, you know where you need to start from now and go ahead and start working towards that. The next part we're gonna talk about is looking for grants which address your needs. And this is the square peg round hole discussion. You know, you don't wanna to try to make your need fit an application that doesn't intend to fund what it is that you need. You know, please don't put yourself in a position where you are trying to make your needs fit the grant. Um, look carefully at who's funding the grant and what it is that they intend to address with the grant. You know, don't just apply for the experience with the grant, knowing that what they have said they're going to fund isn't what you need, because grantors are going to remember that. And maybe in the future, they'll have a, another grant opportunity and it'll actually be what it is that you need to have funded. But because you applied before, they're gonna have a, a bad taste in their mouth thinking, well, you didn't understand with the previous grant application and then it'll kind of set you up to be in a bad light. So make certain that you can you know, clearly see that what they wanna fund is what it is that you need um, to have funding awarded to you for. You know, we have a, a local um, foundation here in our county in Ohio, and they are very clear each year when they put out their grant application, you know, four categories, different categories, and they mix them up and it, what it is that they are asking and saying that they want to fund. And if there isn't something in one of those four listed items that clearly states exactly what I'm helping different nonprofits look for funding for, I'm not going to submit an application because I don't want to leave, you know, a bad sense with them that we were wasting their time. You never want to make a grantor feel like you've wasted their time. The other thing is make certain that, you know, if you do receive the funding, that you clearly know what is the measure of success to that grantor. So you want to make certain that you can complete any reporting requirements they have. Um, and, you know, sometimes um, those can get pretty onerous and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But I wanna know here, how many of you are already subscribed to grants.gov? And it's okay if you don't remember. I know sometimes I get so many emails in my inbox. I, I'm surprised when I, I see something pop up that I didn't remember I had subscribed to. Okay, it looks like the majority of you are not. I would encourage you to subscribe to grants.gov. And the reason why is they do send out a, a summary email. I get one daily. Um, I believe that you can ask, actually ask for it weekly if you prefer that. And it gives you a listing of every single grant opportunity that the federal government has um, put out that day. This is a way that I try to monitor and stay ahead of what the grant opportunities are that can be applied for. And if you find it to be overwhelming after a little while, you know, it, you don't have to subscribe, but if you're gonna be looking for grants for your agency, I highly encourage it. Um, if you want, you can always set up a, a mailbox rule in Outlook and have it automatically move those grant.gov emails over. Um, that that's to this other folder and maybe look at it once a week or once every two weeks. I probably wouldn't go two weeks though, just because if you see something in there you wanna apply for, you wanna be able to get started as soon as possible. So, but take some time after this webinar completes, go out and subscribe to grants.gov. And like I mentioned earlier, there is an outline that goes along with these materials. It's just a, a two page outline, but this information is gonna be on there for you as well. So grant requirements. When you find out that a grant has um, been posted and the grantor is actively soliciting applications, it's really important to take those requirements and go through them with a fine tooth comb. 
you need first off to figure out what your time frame is on a grant. I always go to the, the page that lists the deadline and work backwards from the deadline. Because when you're gonna apply for a grant, there's gonna be pieces and parts that you're gonna need to pull together. And I always try to finish and submit earlier than the deadline, give myself some buffer room because inevitably there's gonna be something that's gonna come up that is gonna, at some point in time, you know, push you past what your own deadline is. And you don't want that to also be the deadline for submitting for the grant, because if you miss their deadline, you know, chances are that they are not going to accept your application late. And that's a 99.9% .9 chance there. The other thing in those requirements is be really careful to determine what it is that needs to be submitted. And this is where I had mentioned earlier that you know, there was a grant that I missed out on because there was a piece that I could not put information in and submit. It was actually something um, that my agency just didn't have available. And because we didn't have it available, um, I didn't submit, you know, that detail, those details, and we were excluded from the grant because we didn't answer that question. So <clears throat> be really careful. I go through and I figure out what it is that has to be submitted. And then if I'm lucky enough to have a team of people working with me, then I get those questions and that information assigned out on uh, the time frame that works in order to get everything back in together. Um, a piece that I kind of alluded to earlier, and I think you need to be really careful of when you're going through the grant requirements, is look at what the reporting requirements are. Because if the reporting requirements are going to be so onerous that your agency can't follow through with them, don't apply for that grant. Um, it would be a terrible situation to be in to have taken someone's money and then not be able to follow through with the reporting requirements that they're asking for. Because then that sets you up for them coming in, possibly, especially if it's um, the Federal Highway Administration and, and doing an audit. And then, you know, asking for funds back because you didn't provide the reporting that was required. And, you know, when I say that, I think of requirements such as the 2 CFR 200. I know that we had some concerns and issues um, with some of our agencies when all of those requirements came out because we did have to have time tracking if our grantees, grantee meaning the agency that received the grant, um, you know, wanted to submit for time reimbursement, then there had to be time tracking. And all of our county engineers are elected officials. So, you know, historically, you know, there were a number of counties that as the they were elected officials weren't doing time tracking. And, you know, in order for them to have their time submitted, then time tracking had to be put in place for all of their hours, not just the hours worked on the federal project. So that's just an example of one of the reporting requirements that I will caution you to make sure that, you know, you look at. And it could be that you decide to move forward with asking for the grant and you just decide not to ask for time reimbursement. And that's fine, too. I mean, look at what the grant will and won't pay for. And there's different levels of um, grant reimbursement a lot of times that can be requested. And then, you know, your section 4F, 6F, where you're looking at land and water conservation or historical, um, you know, properties and make certain that your agency understands, you know, if you get money for um, a funding of a, a park, then that land forevermore is going to need to be a park if you receive certain federal funding under these sections. So just be really careful with your compliance requirements. And that's why I say, go through that application with a fine tooth comb and make sure that you understand, you know, not only what it is they want, but what the long-term impacts are to your agency. When you're going through that application, it never hurts if they haven't given you the scoring matrix to ask them if they're willing to share it. I mean, again, the worst they can say is no, but if they say yes and they give it to you, then 
you have the, the answer key basically to what it is that you're going to be writing your application to. So I would encourage you, you know, that's a, a tip there to make note and be the person that calls up and says, are you willing to share your scoring matrix? Um, and don't be surprised if they send it out to everybody then at that point, but at least you'll have it. And I think that that's an important piece. Once you know that you do want to definitely apply for a grant, you need to go through and decide what your application strategy is going to be. Especially with larger grants, it's great to have a team if you can. Um, you know, know what questions need to be answered and who's going to be doing the responses to those questions if you're able to have a team. Um, the financial plan know who's gonna put that together and then double and triple and quadruple check it. Get somebody outside of the financial area to check it. Um, I have experienced in the past financial plans being submitted that weren't, um, you know, when it came down to it, the grantor found some errors in the plan and it disqualified us from getting an application um, funded. So make sure you've got some time. Don't, if you find out that, today on Thursday that there's a grant application due tomorrow, please don't try to submit for it that quickly. You know, these things do take time. Um, give yourself the time you need to do a good job because again, the grantors tend to award grants over and over at different times. And it's gonna be the same people looking at the information you submit. Um, know when you need additional information, you know, possibly even outside of your agency that has to be collected up. And then the final piece I'm going to discuss here that's on your screen, the letters of support. That's probably something that you need to prioritize at the very beginning when you decide you do want to apply, because a letter of support takes longer to get um, than what you would think. You know, I have had applications where we've needed three and four letters of support, and I've learned through the years that I need to ask for those like day one, because it could very well be that it's gonna have to go quite a ways up the chain of where I'm asking this letter of support from in order for it to be approved that they can provide that. So don't leave that for last, prioritize it as one of your top items when you decide you want to do an application. And again, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a team to work on it, you know, that's great. I will caution you though, even if you do have a team working on it, you need one person who is the grant coordinator who goes through and makes the voice in that application consistent. And when I say the voice, I mean, there could very well be, you know, three or four different people answering questions for this grant. And they're talking about the same thing, but they could be talking about it in different terms, you know, calling the same thing two different names. And when you submit that application, you don't want the grantor and that grant review team to be going through and saying, wait a minute, they, they called it this up here. Well, what is this now down here? I mean, it, chances are they're not gonna be as familiar with your information as you are. So have your grant coordinator go through and make sure that your voice is consistent throughout. If you're gonna call an item one name at the beginning, call it that same name all the way throughout. And I think everybody pretty well understands. I mean, there's a lot of acronyms we use in this um, industry and you just wanna make sure that it looks like the same person wrote the whole application all the way through. Your time schedule is very important and it does not hurt to have check-ins throughout the grant application period with any team that you're working on to make sure that you're staying on track. Don't wait until your deadline day to start asking people for their information. Talk to them because if you find out that they're behind schedule or they aren't gonna be able to get something completed after all, it's best to know that as soon as possible during the grant application time period than to wait until the very end of the last day and find out that they didn't deliver a third of the answers to the questions that you needed. Again, a grant coordinator, and we talked about that briefly already, um, is really great. And it may be that in your agency, you're a small enough agency that you are the grant coordinator and the entire team all together. And that's okay. You can only do what you can do. So 
there's a chance that you'll be looking at smaller grant applications, or if you decide to take on a larger one, then that'll be the only application you work on for a while. But, you know, it's important that any agency has one point person who's writing for grants. So curious, does your agency have a grant coordinator? It looks like there's quite a few agencies that do have a dedicated individual and that's great, but there's quite a few that don't. And that's fine. I mean, have the conversation with your leadership to say, you know, it's important for us to have one person as the point person in this area. And while that may not be their only responsibility, um, but, you know, it's fine to have, you know, a person who does other things who also is the point person for grant coordination. And for those agencies that are rotating the responsibility, that's fine as well. You just don't want to have, find out, you know, when you're getting down to the grant submission time that you've had two different, you know, individuals working on the same thing at the same time. You know, you just want to make certain that you have one point person that's doing those applications. So thank you for your feedback there. I like this little cartoon um, when we're talking about strategy and this sometimes happens. You know, you think you're ahead of the curve and this is then we were ahead of the curve and then the curve ran right over us. And if that happens, it's okay. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off and move on. You know, you're still doing what's important and moving in the right direction. So with grants, we're gonna talk about what to request because this time sometimes can really sink you. First off, I want you to understand, very rarely will you find a grant that's gonna provide 100% of your project's needed funding. I mean, this is a really, really rare situation. Um, I will caveat that with saying that Federal Highway has been incredibly generous in the safety area. There are certain items that they will pay for at 100%. Um, safety signage is one of them. I believe roundabouts are still on that list. But for the majority of the grants that you're going to write for, you know, you are not going to be able to ask for 100% of the project's funding. So you need to understand where the project funding is going to fit and be able to explain how the other expenses are going to continue to be covered. You know, grants typically don't cover what they consider ordinary expenses like payroll and overhead expenses unless it's funding to get something started. And then they're only going to really cover it for a really short period of time. So you need to make certain, you know, what it is the grant says that it will fund or it won't fund um, and make certain that you're not asking for things that they clearly said that they weren't going to fund. And as I mentioned earlier, you also want to make sure that you can show how you're going to be able to maintain what it is that you've asked to have funded into the future without further grant funding. Um, know what it is that your agency can contribute to a project and, you know, make sure that it's part of that pro forma. You know, a lot of agencies, you know, struggle to meet that 20% match for federal funding. So, you know, what I definitely look at, you know, especially with our local public agencies, is to see how they can leverage additional funding sources. You know, it's not uncommon here in Ohio for a county to utilize um, what they call OPWC money. It's the Ohio Public Works Commission funding and use that as their 20% match to put against the 80% the ask for a federally funded project from our state DOT. So there are other funding sources out there and I would encourage you to look at that. You know, also, and I'll back that up here when I talk about the um, making sure you know where your funding sources are, don't discount private sources. There's times that I've seen that private foundations in a county have stepped up to the plate and said that they will offer up certain funds to match for uh, public funds that can be, you know, applied for through different federal grants, 
because they want to see the improvement happen within that county or even private foundations from, um, you know, companies that have those types of foundations out there. So, you know, look beyond even the, the public sources you're aware of to see what type of private sources are out there. And if you're curious what private foundations or private nonprofits um, or, or nonprofit organizations are in your area, you can always go out and do a search on the IRS website. They do have a complete listing of all the um, different nonprofits in each county, um, or you could you know, look to see, I, I know in the past I have done a Google search for 990, which is the tax form number for a nonprofit and, you know, my county's name or my city's name to see, you know, what type of uh, tax returns come up because any nonprofit has to have their tax return available publicly and most of them do it through the, the web. All right, we're down to part seven. So hang in here with me. We're going to talk about answering the questions asked. And what I want to tell you is just give them the facts. If they have asked a question, answer that question. Don't give them the answer you think they want to hear. Give them the answer that they have asked for. You know, this is not the opportunity to try to tell them things that they didn't ask about. Because what will happen is that as they're reading through these applications, they're going to get to the application where the person actually answered the questions that were asked. And they're going to say, hallelujah, they followed the directions. We can trust them with our money because they follow the directions. Let's fund them. So make sure as you're going through that you're not trying to give them extraneous details or information that they haven't asked about. You know, also use plain language. You know, it's important that it be easy to read. You know, if you have terms that you need to share, don't use your acronym. Spell it out and then put the acronym afterwards, but try to make it as easy to read as possible. Because again, they're going to be going through a lot of applications. And the easier to read your application is, the more likely you are to be understood and hopefully funded. In Word, there's this little feature, and you can look it up later. It's called the Fleisch Kincaid Readability Scale. And it'll actually tell you, you know, how complex or non-complex your um, what you've typed up in that Word document is. And then I usually try to shoot for right around a, an eighth grade reading level, not because I don't feel people can understand what I've written above that, but because I want to make it as easy as possible for them to read and understand, especially when they have a large volume of information that they're trying to get through. Acronyms, please be careful not to overload them with acronyms. You know, I know in our industry, we have a lot of acronyms, but you want to make certain that it's as easy for them to read as possible. So don't overload them with acronyms and always make sure to spell out what it is before you include the acronym, even if you think they already know. And again, when I mentioned answering the questions asked, this is, I think, what a person feels like who gets an answer to a question that isn't the answer that they were looking for, but it includes everything, including the kitchen sink. So please don't make the person reading your application feel like this. Keep this picture in mind as you're writing your answer. If they've asked you a simple question, give them a simple answer. And be consistent. I mentioned this earlier. Have one person who reads that application all the way through for your agency before you send it in to make sure that your language is consistent and that the terms you're using are all consistent. Relationships. I have this as part eight, but really this is a key and critical piece that you need to think about all the way through. And you're going to understand this more and more, the more applications that you write for people. Um, relationships can go a long way in the grant writing area. You know, first off, if you are given the opportunity to present on your grant request, don't ever pass that up. Because what you do when you make a presentation on your application is you're able to show them the human side of 
who it is that's asking for that funding. So they've been able to put a, a face with a name and get to know you some, um, but you also are able to answer questions and have a dialogue with them, with them there and, you know, as a part of that presentation. So, you know, start building your rapport. You know, I knew that I had really solidified a relationship with our local foundation when <clears throat> there was an application that I had submitted for and the grantee that I was helping um, on their letter stating that they had been funded at the top, it said, dear so-and-so, you know, the name of the organization, but the president of that foundation had crossed out the name of the organization or wrote in Victoria by hand. And then they put a note at the bottom, personal to me, letting me know, you know, that they were happy to get that application funded and they were looking forward to the end results of what their money was going to be paying for. So make sure you're building those relationships. And don't be afraid to follow up on a grant application, but don't make yourself become a pest. You know, it's okay to follow up, you know, call or email, but don't let the person that you're calling or emailing start getting this look that this little girl has on the screen on their face when they see your name come up on the caller ID. So I think it's very acceptable, you know, to do a, a follow up, um, especially if you haven't heard from them by a a deadline that they said that they were going to put the award information out. Um, but don't be someone who calls every single day. Space those calls out or those emails out. Another thing that I have done is through the years, I have looked at what are the projects that the organization I was applying to was has funded in the past. So look to see what it is that they have funded and how much they have funded, because you don't want to over ask for funding. Um, and, and that's kind of a balance that you learn over time. Um, but you can also look for the type of projects that they like to fund. And again, if it's not the a, um, another public agency that you're getting funding from, um, if it's a, a private nonprofit or foundation, that 990 tax return, which is publicly available, they have to list the largest um, awards that they're making on that application. So you can usually get the information that way. Uh, something I have done as well with my relationship building is I have called and had a conversation with the folks who are giving or the who put the applications out, um, especially if I didn't get funded to say, you know, can you let me know, you know, not only how I could have done better, but are you aware of any other grants that are out there that could possibly fund what it is that we're seeking um, to get funded? Because the individuals who work for those agencies and the, agent, the, uh, the agencies themselves and the nonprofits and foundations all a lot of times run in the same circles in the sense you know, they collaborate with each other, they know what each other's offering, and they can point you in the right direction to, you know, where else you could possibly apply for additional grants. So with that, I'd like to know, especially from those who have written grant applications in the past, um, ways that you've learned what grantors have funded in the past. And we'll give this a second or so here. We're waiting for that. Are there any <laughs> divination? I could guess who put that one in there. Checking their website for past awards. That's great. Web searches, press statements, good. Yep. And if it's your first time applying, look at these other things that people have put in there. You know, definitely checking their websites. Um, you know, lists that have been posted of what they've funded in the past. Federal website. That's great. All right, I'm gonna to talk to them, good. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next question here. Um, just to help each other out, can you share other funding sources you've utilized in the past or considering as part of a future grant application? And while you're putting that information in, um, Regina or Donna, if 
you have questions that have come into the chat box, I'd be happy to. Sure. So Victoria, I captured a few that I thought you might like to respond to. One I thought was really interesting, Nate, when you talked about the square into the round hole and the you know situation mm -hmm. early on, they talked about pilot projects and wondered how you felt about that in relation to the concept of the, the square peg. You know, <clears throat> a lot of times you have to have a, a, you know, a call for those types of projects. I know that the Federal Highway Administration has a specific program for pilot projects that they will fund pilot projects. Um, in addition to that, I believe that the State Transportation Innovation Council, the STIC, they get $100,000 a year and sometimes they will fund pilot projects as well. So, you know, I believe that it's important to not ask for something that they're not looking to fund. But if you feel that you would like to um, you know, ask for funding for a pilot of a project that you think might be covered by their funding, you could always call them and talk to them about it. Thank you. I think that's great. And I think the stick funding is a great opportunity um, through your DOTs. So the other question I saw was when you very early on in the presentation, you talked about preparing your documentation to submit. When you do your grant applications, do you get actual quotes for the for the project specific oh, yeah. details? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Like right great. now, I know in our agency that we're coming up on the T2 funding, the tech transfer funding through Federal Highway. Um, we'll probably be getting that request somewhere around mid-October for to send over T2 projects. I've already started working on quotes for what I would like to request under that. And I know that happens every year. So, you know, I have a leg up, but, you know, don't be bashful to, in getting quotes and then getting them refreshed when the time comes, when you actually find a, a grant out there that is um, live and, and you want to apply for. So know where it is you're, you know, where you're allowed to purchase from, at least in the case of the state where it is we're allowed to purchase from, and then you know get refreshed quotes if you need to. That's great, thank you, that's good information. And the other one was early on when you were talking about wants and needs, someone put into the chat, is improving recycling a want or a need? You know, I would say that that's really gonna come down to your agency and what the goals are that you've set forth and also what the goals are for the grant that you're gonna apply for. Because yeah, in, in some areas of the country, I would think that they possibly wouldn't see that as a need, but in other areas of the country it would be an absolute need. I think that's a great point. I'm just gonna offer up that if anyone has a burning question and wants to drop it into the chat now, so I can see it right away as it comes in, we can catch Victoria. Um, this has been great information, Victoria. I'm very excited to share this back out with you. Thanks. So, I have to comment here. This person that says, hold a bag and stand on a busy street. <laughs> I mean, in all honesty, you know, it does not hurt to talk to organizations in your community. You know, there are Lions Clubs or Rotary Clubs. Um, you know, it depends what their focus is. But I know that our Lions Club here within our community, they have, you know, given funding to a lot of different projects throughout the years. So, you know, I, they may have said that, stand on a bag, corner and hold a bag, tongue in cheek, but it doesn't hurt to educate people in your community about what you're trying to complete or accomplish and you know, see if they're willing to make a donation towards that. So I've put up my name and contact information on the screen. Once you've been on one of my um, grant writing webinars, you are forever in the club of people who can email me to ask me questions if you have them. I'm more than happy to respond. Um, so please keep my information in that file with your general information you're gonna put together if you have questions or, or you know, just wanna reach out and talk about something, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much. I did see one really quick question. It's come up quite a bit in, in uh, my conversations recently is using AI tools when you write the applications. Um, interesting. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you that I would not recommend that because 
I thought using AI was going to be a, a game changer. And I actually tried it for a project that I do on a, a pretty regular basis in my role as a center director. Um, I tried it a few months ago and I was greatly disappointed with the information that came back to me through that AI tool. It was, um, I'll say it, it was chat GPT. So I would not recommend at all um, using AI at this point in time, maybe sometime in the future, but currently it, it, I don't feel that it, it's at the level that you need in order to be asking for funding. I mean, that, that's way too important to be leaving to a, a computer generated tool. I agree. And I feel like who better to tell your story, right? Than, than you and not the AI tool. Absolutely. Victoria, I cannot thank you enough. Um, if other questions came in, I'll take a peek at those as we as we close. Um, we do, we would love for you to be able to uh, use our QR code here um, to evaluate our session and give us feedback on what you might like to see us offer in the future or any follow-ups on this grant writing topic for resources. Uh, Regina, thank you very much for uh, being our wonderful Zoom producer today and, uh, and Vanessa for supporting us and Victoria. Um, so grateful for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for joining. It's great to see you. And we'll send out the recording um, with a follow-up note um, to those that weren't.